Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Uh -huh. So. There's, a, there's an on, excuse me. There is a switch on the microphone. Uh, thank you all for coming out, uh, and thank you, Meredith, for joining us. Delightful to be here. Thank you. So uh, I want to start on a positive now? note. Uh, what are your personal top three existential threats to privacy and free expression? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, let's dig in, Devin. Just, um, ride, just go for it. Just what, whatever comes to mind. Unlike most people in tech, I don't usually think in stack ranks. So I'm not sure this is uh, my top three, nor that I would weight them accordingly. As we go through your, your mental like yeah. castle, what do you see? Well, there are many threats coming from different realms. And so let's start in the legislative realm, where we're seeing a number of, I would say, parochial and very politically motivated pieces of legislation often indexed on the idea of protecting children um, from the crimes done in the dark. Um, and these have been used to push for something that's actually a very old wish of security services, governments, autocrats, which is to systematically backdoor strong encryption. So there should be no network that cannot be accessible to you know, lawful or unlawful intercept. And of course, like since 1976, we know that you know, a backdoor for the good guys is a backdoor for the bad guys, but this wish has not died or gone away, and it's more of a power struggle than kind of an intellectual argument. And we are seeing a lot of new legislation that, you know, under the guise of child protection, often, I believe, pushed by well-meaning people who just don't have the knowledge or education to understand the implications of what they're doing, that could, you know, fundamentally eliminate the ability to communicate privately digitally. And which this is the legislators disaster. that have no education or information? I mean, I'm not in the room. Like, I don't, who's the lobbyist? Is this a biometrics company in the US funding because they want to be the people who are doing some scanning or monitoring or something? Like, I don't know. I think there are a number of interests converging. But the overall theme I'm seeing is a deep desire for accountability in tech, which we saw sort of animated mid 2010s that then was, has been you know, weaponized. I think we're seeing kind of surveillance wine in accountability bottles, where it's like accountability looks like more monitors, more oversights, more backdoors, more elimination of places where people can express or communicate freely, instead of actually checking on the business models that have created sort of you know, massive platforms that whose surveillance advertising modalities can be easily weaponized for information ops or you know doxing or whatever it is right like they're you know an unwillingness to hit at the root of the problem and instead what we see is effectively proposals to extend surveillance into government and NGO sectors in the name of accountability so that's one that's one and well let's we'll, let's uh, let's let's double down on that since we'll get to your next two we'll get there yeah. don't worry one is ai so oh, yeah, well, don't worry we're getting there and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah and all, and if any of the threats are in this room, we can talk about it later, or you can- Please raise your hand. Point with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry, no, I know it's not anybody here, necessarily. Uh, and uh, so, but with specifically, one of, the, one of the laws that we were talking about uh, is the UK right now is uh, with using the Investigative Powers Act, they're sort of bringing it out of the, 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 like, the broom closet to be like, oh, well, now we're not gonna allow updates that we don't uh, approve, and then you can't roll those out globally. There's this, it's, it's this effort of what you're talking about yeah, to yeah. sort of stifle specifically strong encryption, end-to-end -end yeah. encryption for the purposes you mentioned. Is there, is there anything that you can do? You're not in the room, so I guess we just have to let it happen, right? I mean, we make our case clearly, and we make our opinion known, and we have a lot of technical credibility, so we, you know, we advise on this. We were very outspoken when the online safety bill was being proposed, and we see this, there's a, you know, kind of a dual attack happening. One, online safety bill and similar legislation proposing effectively backdoors, right, in the name of this sort of accountability and, and kind of, you know, protecting people from harm. And then there's things like the Investigatory Powers Act, which is effectively claiming for the UK the ability to demand that any tech company across all jurisdictions check in with the UK government before you ship a security patch. 
because they may be exploiting that patch somewhere for some business they want to keep doing, right? Like, imagine, like, there's a form of, again, parochial magical thinking here, but it's very dangerous because we are being threatened to a return before the liberalization of encryption in 1999, kind of an early 90s paradigm where the government has a monopoly on encryption and the right to digital privacy and where the ability to deploy encryption or privacy updates or anything that would secure and harden your service becomes something you have to get permission from the government to do, which was the paradigm up until the late 90s. So it's, you know, we need to pay attention to this. And honestly, I think we need the VC community and the larger tech companies more involved in naming what a threat this is to the industry and pushing back. It's uh, very presumptuous, I must say, to think that you can replace the U.S. as the global security force on, uh, you know, thought police and that sort of thing. I can't speak for the U.K. I don't know. If anybody could do it, maybe it's them. Uh, in the broader, over in that, in that general region, uh, I want to say, though, this is, uh, since, we're, since we're in that geographic region, the EU is actually moving towards this interoperability thing with, with messaging. Obviously, that uh, could be a huge opportunity for Signal, but maybe I'm not thinking it through, and this is also bad news. Well, who has worked in a standards process or like a standards body? Anyone here? Like done the IETF or WC3? Okay, but me too, uh, whoever <laughs> you are. Um, it's a really messy process. It's kind of, you know, like it's a, the original design by consensus, which came from a you know, really good place, right? These were like academics, the graybeards of the internet, sort of, you know, recognizing that for a network to interconnect, we have to have different standards we agree on, right? That's like the, you know, logical reality there, right? And so we still need these standards. And the, you know, the DMA is this sort of, you know, law that wants to figure out a solution to the fact that you have a handful of messaging monopolies that don't talk to each other. Sort of the, you know, blue-green bubbles on, on iMessage. But it's sort of doing so through a standards process in a way. So I think the spirit makes a lot of sense, but of course Signal can't interoperate with another messaging platform without them raising their privacy bar significantly. Because we don't just encrypt the contents of messages using the Signal protocol, we encrypt metadata, we encrypt your profile name, your profile photo, who's in your contact list, who you talk to, when you talk to them. None of that is data we have, anyone who runs our servers had, anyone has but the people involved in that communication, right? And so that would need to be the level of privacy and security agreed across the board with anyone we interoperated with before we could consent to interoperate because they're, you know, we make very clear technologically backed promises to the people who rely on Signal, often in places where physical security is directly linked to digital privacy that we simply are not willing to adulterate. So, you know, that's just one layer of complication. I think there are real issues around integrity, trust and safety, how do you adjudicate things, you know, when you have accounts from one you know, platform talking to another. Um, and so I think I really agree with the spirit of it, but you know, what we are concerned about is that it could actually drop the standard of privacy, creating kind of an interoperative monolith that, you know, further relegates those who are, you know, demanding a, a, a standard of privacy with a lot of integrity to a more marginal position. Gotcha, yeah. So uh, you may still be the, the weird app standing in the corner in a couple of years as the DMA progresses. I mean, we've never been the weird app standing in the corner. <laughs> But um. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but you. So the, speaking of speaking of uh, safety and privacy, there's a new signal sort of standard and feature the uh, using usernames rather than uh, phone numbers as a sort of primary uh, interface for doing contacts. Can you tell us tell us a little about that? Like it, it, it sounds significant, but I can't say quite how or why it took this long to sort of make this the the, the default. Well, let me start. Uh, by kind of explaining that with an example. Um, in India recently, it has become a requirement in order to obtain a SIM card to submit to a biometric facial recognition scan. That is not just happening in India. We're seeing a number of jurisdictions where to obtain a phone number, you are required to provide more and more personal information some, in some places, like Taiwan, that is linked to a government ID, databases that often get breached and cause a lot of problems. So that identifier 
in the US, you can get a burner still, you know, you can buy that data from cell phone companies and it's not always private, but it's not, it's not as acute a privacy issue in the US as it is in many other places, and that is simply increasing. So a request we got frequently from journalists in conflict zones, from human rights workers, was like, hey, we love it, but the phone number is a real issue for us. We need to be able to speak with people without sharing this information. We need to be in groups of strangers where we're not afraid that they can scrape that. And we need to be able to initiate conversations with others without sharing our phone number. Because again, that, you know, that's my biometrics, that's everything else, and that can leak a significant amount of information. So we did, a I mean, we basically turned our architecture inside out to support this and to support it in a way that I'm really proud of because you know, as Signal, we do not want to take responsibility for content. We are not entering into the sort of content adjudication business. But of course, with usernames, traditionally, you create a new namespace, right? You create something that you, in effect, have to monitor, perhaps police, perhaps censor, kind of you know, deal with. And so we did this in what I would say is a sort of safety by design way that allowed us to stay very true to our principles, which is we just don't take on that work. We're unwilling to you know, create a, a block list or other things to sort of determine what is and is not appropriate. We're also unwilling to create new surfaces for harm, right? Like we recognize that that can be a real issue. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna design it so that we've minimized or I believe eliminated the sort of harm space. So the username is not a handle. It's not shown inside the app. It's not something we have a directory for but it replaces the phone number when you go to initiate contact. So I think there's actually kind of a paradigm around safe and sort of you know, design with integrity that we're also pushing forward as we add a very essential layer of privacy to the app. And you can read about that should launch soon in the new, next client version 7.0, it will be launching to everyone who has that version updated. Uh, and if you're a beta user, you can go in and like claim your username now, uh, if you're if you're about that. I will. Uh, so speaking of designing with integrity, let's talk about AI. Um, we, we talked we talked great for, segue. Uh, so for so long we talked we talked to, uh, in at Disrupt about AI, and you wrote this great paper. Everybody should read Meredith's paper and your your co-authors uh, about how the the claims of openness in by AI companies and AI developers aren't really true. And we, we, so we, we kind of talked that to death, but there's something else I want to talk about, which is the power behind the power that we've all seen sort of emerge, like erupt out of the, the new AI economy, and that's NVIDIA, which is this just huge, gigantic, I don't even know how to describe it. It's absolutely, without NVIDIA, there's no AI. It doesn't exist. It's it not possible. It is the chip monopoly. Yeah. It's and a, it, it's, the CUDA monopoly. And the CUDA monopoly. Yeah, it's all these things. <laughs> So what is, give me, your, give me your NVIDIA take. I mean, we all, everybody, ha, everybody uses it. Everybody here uses something that ultimately drills down to a NVIDIA GPU or a H100 or whatever. Uh, what, is, what is your take on this? Like, is this, is it, has it become a dangerous company in this way? I mean, I don't, we have a lot of Spider-Men pointing at each other, right? In, you know, like, Yes, NVIDIA is a core dependency and it is not being displaced soon. They have the fabs tied up. They have the contracts with that Dutch company that does the um, you know, extreme ultraviolet lithography. They have CUDA, which is not a thing that can be easily displaced. Like when you talk about a lack of talent for machine learning, you're talking about a lack of CUDA developers. They started that framework in 2006. They've been integrating libraries and sort of, you know, kind of standards from the academic research community for a long time. They've been hosting developer communities. So like the water AI research swims in and AI development is NVIDIA. It's the, the analogy for those of you who don't spend time in this, in this realm is basically the Apple developer ecosystem, right? a huge, like great libraries, like beautiful UX affordances. You can do, it's all open to use, but of course it only runs on Apple's proprietary systems, their hardware, right? And that's, the, that's what CUDA is, but that's for the entire AI ML ecosystem. And that's why, it, you know, it doesn't, AMD has a plausible competitor, they don't have CUDA, right? And that's why AMD isn't, you know, and you know, of course Google has TPUs and TensorFlow, but that is used internally and for some jobs, it's a little more efficient, but they still 
license GPUs because that's the standard, right? That's how machine learning gets built. So NVIDIA is a giant a core dependency. It's not going to be easy to displace, you know, particularly if you look at just sort of the TSMC, um, kind of the, the process to actually create a new fab, create new, you know, capacity there. It's just there's no time, right? Um, or, or the timelines we're looking at are not the sort of AI hype cycle timelines. But I kind of, you know, I'm seeing Microsoft pointing fingers at NVIDIA now and saying like, oh, you know, you really need to, if you're, if you're worried about monopoly, do not look to poor Microsoft. You look to NVIDIA, they're the ones. And you also look to Google. Google is the only, they, they put out this sort of uh, PR missive last week, um, kind of their AI access principles, and they, they talked about Google being the only vertically integrated company from App Store to chips. And that's true, right? But then Google published a couple days later, like Microsoft is actually the monopoly because it has the open AI and sort of the Azure monopoly, right? So there's a lot, like no one is innocent here. Um, I think you should leave hot dog guy. We're all trying to find the guy who yeah. did this. Um, and I think we need to recognize like this isn't, you know, that it's, you know, AI is dependent on big tech. It requires big tech resources. It is not open in any sense we can be honest about, right? If you, if you need $100 million for a training run, that is not an open resource, right? If you need $100 million to deploy at scale for a month, that is not open, right? So we need to be kind of honest about how we're using these terms. Um, but I don't, I don't want the deflection toward like NVIDIA as the culprit of the week to detract from what we're dealing with is massively concentrated power. And I don't think there is a way to diffuse that without actually radically shifting the bigger is better AI paradigm, which is dominating the field right now. And it's, it's dominating for, because it's essentially been effective in creating these, largely the LLMs, but uh, you know, some, other, some other models. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's creating the use cases that people are gobbling up, although I'm, I'm still not sure if people but are wait, actually using. what use using. cases? Well, that's the, they're the, you know, the ones everybody are using. No, but. All okay. of them. No but, no but. Um, I think I am not clear what the real business model is, right? Like ChatGPT is an advertisement for GPT APIs you can license from Azure, but it's not making Microsoft any money. What's making Microsoft their money is you know, the ability to license those APIs. And if you look at the cost of training and then inference of these models, I don't, you know, an email prompt or an information retrieval intermediary or even co-pilot, it's not clear that the amount of money going into the solution is really how we want to solve those problems. So I see, you know, I see, I see the business model not being baked. I do see the only pathway toward customers still being through these large tech companies, right? Like that was, you know, the, the light speed, um, gentleman who was up here before said that more diplomatically, but like, what did Mistral need? They need compute and they need access to customers. And there's no, you know, that's cloud contracts or that's owning a massive platform like Meta. There's still no business model beyond that. And what problem these solve for the cost is still not clear. Um, I, you know, I'm sure you all are diversified. You'll be fine, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, sure it's fine. <laughs> And what do you think about the uh, what do you think about the databases that are being built? I think it, when I think about how much ChatGPT or you know Claude or whatever is being used every day, thousands and thousands, millions and millions of prompts, asking for this and that and all this kind of thing, and that's all going into a gigantic bucket where they're like, boy, is this bucket going to be valuable in a couple of months when we make the next one or try to sell it to the next guy? I mean, like, like all the data they are both collecting and creating. Yeah, I mean, that every then becomes... single thing. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a surveillance technology, right? It doesn't, you know, it relies on surveillance, which is the mass data that is scraped from the web and sort of, you know, labeled or, you know, calibrated, depending on the type of model you're building. Um, this is a technology that produces surveillance data, even if it's through inference, not through sort of direct observation or its proxy. And this is a technology that in using it, you are providing very intimate data often to these companies that they're using for, you know, whatever. And, you know, we don't have a federal privacy law, so for what, whatever is still kind of the, the paradigm there. Uh, we only have a few seconds left, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to clap back at Apple for their quantum 
shade that they threw at you, just in case oh. you wanted that. Oh, no, we, being talked about by Apple is fine. Um, you know, welcome to the party. We were there May 2023. And it is really important now to begin securing your crypto systems for a future in which sufficiently powerful quantum computers could crack encryption today and read all the data that we're protecting with it. So Signal did that. We deployed it in 2023. We were the first messenger uh, to do so. Apple followed suit very recently and sort of did a whole, you know, their marketing team spun up beautiful branding. They're so good at that, you know, with a kind of explanation of adding post-quantum. But like, we're a nonprofit. We're not here trying to sell Signal over Apple. If we can raise the bar and keep raising it, that's actually our goal. So it is really good that Apple's doing that. And you all should actually worry about that now because you don't want to be 10 years from now realizing that everything in your encrypted database is now open to scrutiny because you didn't secure it with a PQ uh, algorithm. Oh, well, that's something to worry about 10 years from now, I guess. So we can talk yeah. about it then. That or climate, <laughs> I don't know. But. All right, well, thank you very much, Meredith. Always a pleasure. Thank you.